Good afternoon. We might make a start. Welcome to uh, the Living with Disability Research Centre seminar for uh, September. And this afternoon's um, this afternoon's presentations are about the history of Q cottages. Um, if you just want to move on the slide, Richard, and we're going to we've got two speakers who are both academics from La Trobe. Um, who have been researching the history of Kew Cottages for some considerable period of time. I should just paint the background to this afternoon's uh, presentations. Back in 2003, um, the then Department of, Community, of Human Services was planning the closure of Kew Cottages and were, uh, had significant foresight about the, the importance of this institution and put out a tender uh, to undertake a linkage project um, with the department and with the Australian Research Council to write the history of Kew Cottages. And uh, a team of us from the tribe that was led by Professor Richard Broom, who's talking this afternoon, and Katie Holmes, myself and Leanne Monk were the successful uh, applicants for that project and it ran from 2005 and it's still running. Um, it's probably been the most longest running, most productive linkage grant you could imagine. Um, and so the history of Kew Cottages has been being written and continues to be written and Kew Cottages continues to play a very significant uh, part in the history of intellectual disability services, uh, both in Victoria and in Australia. And you can see there, those are some of the, the outputs um, that have come from this project. And there's a book, there was a photo archive, there was a film, there was an exhibition and a CD, there's a radio documentary, um, a website, and a whole range of, of articles. At the moment, the website is being uh, re, reformatted because, um, Microsoft changed <laughs> changed the software so it was no longer valid. Um, and the final product of this um, of this project is very close to finish being finished and at the moment we're looking for publishers. So that's the sort of background to this afternoon. Um, and we will have a, a launch when the book is finally um, published, probably sometime next year. But this is a sort of taster of what's to come, I guess. There's two speakers this afternoon. The first is, is Professor Richard Broom and the second is Dr. David Henderson. Um, Richard Broom, many of you may know if you know anything about history in Victoria. Um, he was, was a professor at La Trobe, he's now an emeritus professor. He's the president of the Royal Historical Society, the president of the Royal Historical Society of Victoria. Um, the patron of the History Teachers Association, and I know has written a lot of textbooks that are used in secondary schools, um, but most recently has just finished, um, I think five volumes of uh, a history text for the new curriculum for history. So Richard's a very well-known, very well-regarded um, historian. So I'm gonna hand over to him and he's going to talk about one particular episode in the history of Kew Cottages, the, the fire. So over to you, Richard, and welcome to our seminar. Thank you very much, uh, Chris. That's wonderful to be here and to speak to you all, and thank you for listening. I'm going to call, talk about the Kew Cottages fire of 1996, and this was uh, my uh, substantial research towards uh, this whole project and writing this book. Uh, and so um, I've actually recently just published an article about the, the Q fire in the Victorian Historical Journal, and I've got at the, in my last slide the details if you want further information. Now, there are about four contexts that uh, played a role in the background to the fire, and uh, all of them were sort of contexts that degraded the, uh, the Q cottages. The first of all was the context of disability and the way it is viewed in society. Q in particular, Q Cottages had a peculiar history in that after their formation in 1887, within about three to five years, there were efforts to move Q on elsewhere 
And so it was a temporary for at least four decades of its, uh, of it, of its life, almost half of its life it was seen to be temporary and that it affected um, the amount of money that was poured into a uh, queue. It, it was seen to be temporary because the local residents in queue didn't want it to be there. Basically, they felt it was a stigma on their uh, on their suburb, a developing suburb of some grandeur in, in Melbourne. And a similar thing occurred with uh, the um, people that lived in Pentridge Village where the prison was and eventually they changed the name of their suburb to Coburg in 1867 to try and get rid of the stigma of having such an institution in their midst. So Q suffered from this uh, um, whole problem of whether it was to be temporary or not. And there was constant efforts to get rid of it and go government was constantly unwilling to spend a lot of money on it because it was deemed to be temporary. Also, uh, of course, people with disabilities were seen to be uh, uh, the least powerful in society and therefore the least likely to have money spent on them. Uh, this happens to all people in institutions. Uh, governments are always begrudging spending money on, on people who don't have a voice, who don't have power in society. And of course, there was probably the politics of shame, which was shared by many people in society about people with disabilities, even including the families themselves. And so this has a, a great impact on, on how Q is, is uh, developed, how it's funded, etc. It has few advocates. One of the most important things we found in the book was the journalists of Melbourne were so important to uh, highlighting over the years um, the conditions at Q. Virtually every decade or several times a decade, there would be an expose by a Melbourne journalist on uh, the conditions of Q cottages that would lead to outpourings of anger and shame and there would be some, some uh, monies poured in but it then inevitably slipped back. And of course the parents didn't have much of a voice until perhaps the 1940s they began to speak out in letters to the editor about the conditions for their children at Q. So this was one of the most important contexts, background contexts for uh, the, the fire in 1996. The second one would be the changing ideas of intellectual disability. And in the book, uh, uh, Leanne Monk and David Henderson, who have been the major writers of the book, have shown us how Q um, reflected ideas internationally and in Australia about intellectual disability. So the book will be a wonderful way to track the growth of ideas in society about intellectual disability. So when Q began in 1887, there was a, a sense of hope about institutions for people uh, um, with these disabilities. Through education, there was the belief that they could be uplifted. But by the 1920s, eugenics took over the ideas about race hygiene um, the idea that, that certain people should not be allowed to move freely in society because they were a threat to society itself and it's um it's and the right the idea of race hygiene was a very um common phrase of the day so there was a social threat seen from people with intellectual disabilities this began to change after the Second World War with new legislation, new promise from governments and, and, and new personnel, including Cunningham Dax, who came in the 1950s, which uh, David writes about. And so there was a new emphasis on programs, but it wasn't until the 1970s that there was a real critique coming from uh, overseas uh, commentators and uh, researchers talking about the problems of benevolent segregation and pushing for a normalization of the lives of people with intellectual dis disabilities and also a sort of related uh, argument that people should be moved out of the old 19th century institutions. And so these two 
forces led to another context which operated around the time of the fires. The third context was really coming out of these policies of normalization and deinstitutionalization was it was going to cost money to do that. In one sense, deinstitutionalizing people might save money because all these old and aging 19th century buildings could be dispensed with. But on the other hand, it was going to cost quite an, a considerable amount to move people out. And even within the institution, normalization was going to cost a lot of money. Now, here's a, a map of uh, a building with two units, 28 and 29. And in the 1960s, these uh, were, were built and developed uh, from uh, to replace the old style dormitories. And so they were to create rooms for people with uh, broken up into living areas with a kitchen, with a living, a living area, uh, a laundry, et cetera, and bedrooms off that. But what this does is it costs quite an enormous amount to do this to a building. And it creates also a building that's quite uh, incredible in the way it's laid out. It's almost some sort of a maze or labyrinth if you look at this, this uh, image of it. So um, this was a context, it was going to cost a lot of money to, to implement these policies. And in, in a sense, they were only halfway through when the fire happens. And the fourth context would be, of course, um, the whole economic uh, condition of society at the time. As you probably know, if you remember, uh, there was a stock market crack, crash in 1987. Uh, it was quite big overseas, but it was a 40% crash in Australia, which uh, led to a lot of economic repercussions and ripples. It was the time of the recession that Paul Keating famously said, this was the recession Australia had to have. But of course, Lee Kuan Yew over in Singapore said Australia was going to become uh, a country of poor white trash. So it's quite um, a massive impact uh, economically. 10% uh, jobless rate is very high, much more than we've experienced through this pandemic, really. And it led to uh, great uh, uh, economic problems. For instance, the Pyramid uh, Building Society in Geelong that had been offering massive interest rates of 17% suddenly overextended and collapsed in 1990. And it, it, it almost ruined the town of Geelong. The state bank was implicated with this and then the state bank had to be basically bailed out and taken over by the Commonwealth Bank of Australia. So uh, it actually led to the fall of the Kane government because John Kane had said, these institutions are going to be fine, the pyramid's solid, state bank solid, but in fact, that proved not to be the case. So Jeff Kennett was elected in uh, 1992. And there we saw the implication, uh, uh, imposition, I should say, of a neoliberal philosophy onto the Victorian state. Uh, ideas of small government, privatisation, remember all the privatisations of all the utilities, the end of the Metropolitan Board of Works, the end of the uh, Electricity Authority, the water authorities. It was quite massive across society. All those uh, regional water authorities went as well. Uh, there were council amalgamations, massive spending cuts right across the board. And of course, even Pentridge a Prison closed after a, about 111 years. Uh, so this was a time of, of massive change. And what was it to bring for Q? Well, the fire that I'm going to be talking about broke out in building 37 in units 31 and 32. And it, this unit had pretty much the exact layout as the one I showed you before, uh, just uh, in an adjoining building, but I don't have a plan uh, at the moment of building 37, but it was very, very similar to this. So building 37 had been built in about 1960. It was originally for uh, about 40 uh, residents. It had been increased um, 
till the early 1990s to take 50% more than that. And then in the early 90s, it was again changed to fit in with the policy of normalisation. So it was to be divided into five flats with adjoining bedrooms, adjoining kitchen, living areas, laundries, etc. And it was divided off as you saw the other building was almost a labyrinth um, of, uh, of a building. Well, on the 8th of April 1996 was actually uh, at the time of Easter. Um, at 10.49, a fire began in the roof space of uh, a flat E in building 37. Now, there was initially uh, a great deal of confusion because the MFB had the, the alarm had gone off. They rang up Q uh, the, at the central office on site at 10.56 and uh, asked, was there a fire? They, because there are always false alarms. They asked and they said, uh, uh, no, there's no fire. And of course, um, there was no knowledge in building 37 there was a fire at first because it was in the ceiling space. So there was initial a confusion for certainly some minutes about, about whether there was a fire or not. But then finally, um, the MFB decided to come. The staff on duty were alerted in building 37 and, in, and indeed saw smoke. So bedroom E was uh, an inquiry found was the origin of the fire. And so the, the Metropolitan Fire Brigade arrived at 11.01, which was very quick time. And they brought three appliances because they always came to Q well prepared. They were very familiar with the, the nature of Q, which is a series of buildings spread over a large site. Many of you would know that. And some of these buildings would be very difficult to access. So they always came with significant uh, um, uh, equipment. Now this graphic shows some of the problems of uh, building 37. One was that there were two staff on that night for 46 residents, which subsequently was found to be very inadequate. The other thing was that the residents were locked in, both the outside doors were locked, but there were many, many internal doors that were locked. This was seen to be for security, so that residents would not be wandering in the night. The other problem was that during this period of normalization and, and the shift to uh, a re redesign, um, the building was still unfinished and particularly and tragically so in terms of the sprinkler system, because at the last minute, uh, the sprinkler system had to be not commissioned because there was found to be asbestos in the building. Now, uh, this became a, a great problem because there was no sprinkler system to operate on the evening. Now, what was the cause of the fire? Well, it's not definitive, but uh, later inquiries believed that it was caused by a resident who they called Paul because they didn't want his identity to be known uh, because he was not seen to be in any way uh, responsible legally. Paul, it seemed, had a fascination with cigarette lighters. Paul had been found over a number of times in previous weeks and months with cigarette lighters that he some somehow acquired. Now, a later inquiry criticised the lack of uh, passing on of this information in case files and notes uh, and, and the lack of reading of, the, of this information. But it seems on the day there'd been an excursion and Paul had been found with a cigarette lighter. It was taken from him. When they came back to Kew Cottages, uh, he was found to have acquired another cigarette lighter. Um, of course, these were the days when many staff smoked. So there were a lot of possibilities of getting lighters from people. And so it's believed that Paul, uh, who was known to have the ability to work a cigarette lighter, um, did have the lighter in his bedroom, uh, play, possibly played with it and set the bedding alight. And that's how the fire began. Now the fire was horrific. The intensity it reached 
in a very short time, the, it was estimated to be about 600 degrees. And there was absolute chaos in this half an hour because the fire was under control by 11.29. But in that virtual 28 minutes that the fire brigade were fighting it, there was absolute chaos inside. Um, and this was evident when I saw the building in 2005, it was still as it had been left the day after the fire. It was a tangled mess of uh, metal beds twisted, there were personal effects still on the floor. There were walls half burnt out, half, half falling down. The roof was not on. And it was a scene of a shambles, really. Um, and so you can imagine what it was like in that uh, night of the fire. The difficulties of evacuation were immense. You had two staff members, 46 inmates, some of them with mobility problems. Some of them are perhaps under uh, some sort of uh, drug uh, uh, use, uh, given drugs for their sedation or to sleep. Um, and there was, of course, a great deal of incomprehension about what was going on. So during the situation, some residents were brought outside and then went back inside. And the firemen who were inside said it was a, a situation of great chaos. They were trying to bring people out. Um, they, were, uh, they couldn't find them. They were in all, all, all places. And, uh, and so it was massively difficult, difficult in that, that half an hour. And some of the MFB officers who did magnificent work were almost overcome by the exhaustion of having to carry people out immense heat inside. And the staff at the time were courageous too. The two staff on duty, Peng and, and, and Bartful, that's their first names, they uh, went in and out. In particular, Peng went in and out until he was finally overcome with, uh, with smoke inhalation. The death toll, of course, out of that fire was nine of the 10 residents of flat uh, E. Uh, Paul was the one to survive. And they are, they were long-term residents of institutions over 30 years uh, average uh, for the nine people. Now the initial reactions um, to the fire were immense, absolutely immense, as this headline uh, in the Herald Sun, cottages of death shows and an aerial image of the devastation um, with inside. Um, the press, the, the age was the same, ran on the first day about seven to eight pages solid on the Q fire. It was quite a, a remarkable. There were interviews with uh, parents, there were interviews with staff on site. Uh, their interviews with, with, with the Far East, and there were reporters taking pictures, and that was an, a massive spread. Uh, but it didn't let up because the press followed this issue in a very intense way for weeks, and some of them for months. The public also uh, was shocked, and many of them sent letters to the newspapers. Uh, they were interviewed by uh, journalists, particularly if they were parents or the former staff, etc. And so there was a lot of people just writing in and, and there were two responses. One of them that was that Q should go immediately. It should be closed. It was out of date. It was in poor condition. But there are others who just wanted it to be there, to be, be, be reformed. So. These, these two responses are, are there. There was a lot of uh, comment from advocates groups, uh, particularly Valid, uh, which is a Victorian advocacy group. And much of their thrust was about spending and budgets. That Q was underfunded, it had always been underfunded, and this was typical of institutions. And um, the age at the time said that there'd been about 381 fires in institutions in the previous year. It's an enormous thing. And of course, there'd been uh, losses of life before this, 
um, and most notably in the uh, the old uh, Lonsdale men's home where 30 men died in a fire in 1966. So um, there was letters from New Zealand, from advocate groups all over Australia, shocked by the whole thing, obviously thinking that this could happen to our institution as well. For Q parents, there was massive trauma. There was trauma for the families who'd lost the nine, um, and there was trauma for all the other residents at Kew who thought uh, we dodged a bullet here for our child or our, yeah, our um, brother or sister. And so um, there was enormous uh, angst, people writing letters, people being interviewed. And the whole theme of all this initial reaction was the great tragedy of the sprinklers not quite being ready. And that always is a shock in any in any tragedy, the almost what if it had been. The, the what if factor was very strong here. But there was growing anger about budget cuts and very quickly the, the press, the public start to blame the government led by Jeff Kennett. Elizabeth Hastings, I think, who was the commissioner of the Human Rights and Equal Opportunity Commission, herself a person with a a disability uh, being wheelchair bound, her point was a somewhat a bit different. She said, under the act that had existed since the 1980s, which gave people with uh, disabilities equality, that why did anyone think that they could lock people up in a building that had no sprinkler system? This was just intolerable. So the pouring of our grief was immense. There was a, a service the next day in the uh, Kew Residential Services Rose Garden for staff and families of Kew residents. Within a few days, there was a, a church service attended by many people at the Sacred Heart in Kew. And then at St Paul's Cathedral, um, there was a, a general service um, attended by the governor attended by the leader of the opposition, John Brumby, but it wasn't attended by Jeff Kennett, who said he had a prior engagement, which caused further outrage from everyone about, uh, about the government's stance. Now, at that um, St Paul service, Bishop James Grant gave the eulogy. Uh, he spoke about the tragedy of Q and the inability to uh, make it a better place and pose the vision that Q residential services could be the site of cutting edge policies for people with intellectual disabilities. It could become, as he called it, the gem of Victoria if only there was the will. Investigations began immediately, and the emphasis was on underfunding and the finger pointing was at the government. In fact, ironically, on the morning of the day after the fire, there was published a letter in the paper, and it had to have been written a few days before the fire, in which Robert Redford talked about how, it, how can it be that the government can find money for, for many, many things, including $30,000 for a new table in Jeff Kennett's office at Parliament House and renovations to Parliament House when it couldn't give extra money to um, Q Cottages. It was one of the great ironies that this letter was published on that morning. The Age began a four week detailed investigation uh, called Victoria's Forgotten People. Uh, it did interviews, it uh, sought uh, government responses, uh, and after it finished, it published a series of articles which basically found that the uh, system uh, for people with uh, disabilities in Victoria was in crisis, there was massive underfunding, and there was uh, just very poor facilities across the whole sector, whether they be inside institutions or in, in the uh, 
care sector outside. It found that the, the Act um, of 1986 had been breached because there was a lack of duty of care that was supposed to be in place under the Act and a lack of equal treatment. And it found excessive use of chemical and uh, drug uh, restraints um, for people uh, because of underfunding, lack of staff, etc. There were immediately on all fronts calls for a Royal Commission. Uh, Jeff Kennett kept resisting this. And I think because um, he, he didn't want the true picture of, of what had happened in, in the system uh, into public view. And he said that there would be a coronial inquiry, of course, which would get to the bottom of the matter. But of course, that would be the bottom of a very narrow set of criteria about what happened at the fire, what happened on site, and what were the responses. He also, um, at this time, just a, a year before the fire, the uh, members of the Q Parents Association had decided to take the Victorian government to court over the lack of duty of care under the 1986 Act. Um, and that was still in play at the time of the fire. But the government had uh, tried to um, get that thrown out as a vexatious claim, uh, which, was, was, which was not complied with by the Supreme Court of Victoria. Uh, but then Jeff Kennett said to the parents, if you lose this case, you will pay the court costs. So he's trying to play really hard ball to, to stop any real investigation of what had been going on in Kew. Now the inquiry um, then, um, as I said, the uh, Royal Commission was rejected by the government um, and they were the ones in the end that, that could decide what sort of inquiry was to take place. And so it came down to a coronial inquest by Graham Johnson, the state coroner. Now, it was an extremely uh, uh, complicated and a, a close grained investigation by uh, Graham Johnson and the inquiry sat for 80, 81 days. And what's quite amazing is that the Q Parents Association decided that to honour their children, to honour the nine men who died, that they needed to be present at the inquiry. And so led by Jeff Welshman, they organised a, uh, a roster of parents to be at the inquiry and Jeff Welshman himself went to that inquiry 81 days in a row. It was fairly predictable that he had a heart attack um, within uh, uh, months of that inquiry finishing. The report was a 496-page uh, report, which is extremely detailed and um, mainly found uh, that uh, the fault was clearly with the government. It cleared the staff at Kew of any wrongdoing. It said the, the Metropolitan Fire Brigade had acted with great speed, with great courage and, uh, and with great effort. And, and of course, this was the view of the public as shown in this uh, cartoon uh, published by uh, Knight in the Herald Sun. They ain't heavy, they're our brothers. And it, it was interesting that the inquiry uh, uncovered that consultants to the government for 10 years had been warning of the dangers of fire inside Kew, that fire systems were inadequate, they were not in every part, of buildings and of course as we know in building 37 they were not even turned on. So um, the inquiry then uh, found the government at fault but Graham Johnson said that he was pleased that the government had already started to uh, spend 75 million across the, uh, the sector of uh, those under the Department of Human Services and uh, so he found that that was heartening. But of course, any other um, 
possibility of redress was um, was stymied by it being a coronial inquest. Um, the Q Parents Association seemed in the end satisfied with what the inquiry found and decided to withdraw their action against the government and possibly were scared about what the financial implications could be if they were not found um, to be right. So what can we conclude about this? Certainly um, that the new ideas that were coming into the disability sector <coughs> of normalisation and deinstitutionalisation were going to create more costs um, and, uh, and also that that was um, ramped up by the, the temporary state of these institutions. Governments were very disinclined to spend any money if they thought they were going to be closed up soon. And of course, all this was played out in one of the more severe economic recessions of the, uh, the late 20th century in Australia. Australia had experienced pretty much a long boom since the Second World War. Um, but there were uh, short, sharp recessions in the early 80s and the early 90s. And so this led in the 90s to um, the rise of neoliberal um, policies and spending cuts, the push for small government. And of course, in 1996, those at Kew were still the lowest priority in the state for spending. And clearly the duty of care um, set up in the 1986 Act um, was breached and didn't have any real substance. So the fire happens in a liminal moment of change uh, where all these policies, um, where the economic contexts are working against um, Q being safe. So the outcome, as I said, in the short term, money was spent across institutions, but then in the longer term, normalisation and deinstitutionalisation, which David is going to talk about, um, started to be revitalised. But um, obviously for parents, all this was to create renewed trauma. The fire was traumatic itself, but of course then the uncertainty of what was going to happen um, to the places of, for their family members uh, created even more trauma. So thank you very much. Okay, so I'm going to introduce Dr. David Henderson, who's going to bring us up to up to date on some of the history of, of Kew Cottages. David's a historian, many of you know he's part of the Living with Disability Research Centre, who has responsibility for, for organising and making sure these seminars work well. <laughs> He's a historian who strayed into disability quite a long time ago now when we were doing a project about self-advocacy um, and he supported a number of self-advocates to write their life stories while we were researching the history of Reinforce and he's just sort of hung around um, doing all sorts of interesting things but for the last two or three years he's been writing the, the ending chapters so Leanne has written the the early work, the 19th century, and he's been writing the 20th century story of Q. So over today, over to you, David, for part of that history. Thanks, Chris. Um, can I just check these these slides are appearing properly for you guys, aren't they? Aren't they? You can't see the notes? Yeah, good. Nice one. Um, so thanks, Richard, for that great talk. Um, it's this chapter, this uh, presentation builds uh, on what happened next, uh, essentially, and which means that Kenneth is also a part of this story, but not for too long. Um, so on the 7th of September 2099, uh, three years and five months after that terrible fire ripped through building 37 at the Kew Cottages, the Victorian Premier, Jeff Kennett, vowed to close the cottages by 2010. And when he made that comment, Kennett was two weeks out from an election that he was ultimately about to lose, but he had this really strong lead in the, po in the polls at the time, so there would have been very few people who would have ever thought that Kennett would lose the election that year. 
And when he made, um, and Kevin's promise to close CUBE was part of the Liberal Party's um, an announcement of its community services policies. And when he spoke about the cottages, he made it clear that he believed that the institutions like the CUBE cottages were the relics of another time. Um, so the Q Cottages was the last of Victorian's 19th century institutions for people with intellectual disabilities, he said. And uh, that institute, those institutions belong in the past. So that statement was true enough to the extent that the Victorian government had actually been committed to a policy of deinstitutionalisation de in one form or another since 1978. And that commitment had really come about after this really wide ranging government inquiry into services for people with intellectual disabilities, which ultimately recommended a complete overhaul of the entire system. <clears throat> and so those recommendations have come about uh, from what we now come from what we now refer to as the Evans report. And that our report was named after the psych psych psychiatrist Jack Evans, who led that review. And his report made a whole range of recommendations about how services could be better organised. But the key recommendation of relevance here is the recommendation that urged the Victorian government to commit to the provision of residential services other than in large scale institutions. At the time, that report didn't really use the term of deinstitutionalisation, but by the time that legislation for the reorganisation of services for people with intellectual disabilities was introduced, and that was in 1986, um, the Victorian government was committed to this policy of deinstitutionalisation and it was also using that terminology. So between 1978, when that report was handed down, and 1999, when Kennett announced the close, the, his commitment to closing Q, six institutions for people with intellectual disabilities had been closed. And the number of residents living in institutions during this period had fallen from 4,439 in 1978 to 873 in 1999. Um, now, I just showed that slide that outlined a bit of a timeline on, some, on the closure of some of those institutions, and I'm not going to go into each in institution, but I do want to dwell for a moment on the closure of St Nicholas, because it was, it was a sort of precursor uh, to the closure of other institutions, and it provided a blueprint for closing other institutions uh, across the state. So St Nicholas was a small institution in Carlton that housed just over 100 children with severe and profound intellectual disabilities. And there were a number of things that made it a prime candidate for closure. First, it was this really gloomy old institution whose main buildings were in need of urgent repair. Second, the institu institution occupied 1.25 hectare hectares of prime real estate that was really close to Melbourne CBD. And it was anticipated basically that the sale of that property would easily cover the costs involved of re relocating residents to less restrictive accommodation in the community. And a final uh, issue was that the institution had been subject to intense public scrutiny and debate in the late 1970s. And this had been sparked by a ward assistant, Rosemary Crossley, who claimed that some of the residents at St Nicholas should never have been placed in an institution in the first place. And all of this really gave the government enough impetus to close the institution as soon as it was really practical. So that closure was announced in 1983, but it took almost two years to close the institution. And there were really four guiding principles that underpinned the closure of uh, that institution. And, th and they're up there. The first was obviously that people with intellectual disability had a right to live in the community and that that right should stand irrespective of the level of anyone's disability. Another principle was that, relocate, that relocated residents should have access to day programs uh, that were located outside of their house and access to generic services as distinct from specialist services wherever possible. And that fourth principle was that the care provided by staff in any, any newly established community residential unit should be family-like rather than custodial, although what that actually meant in practical terms was never really made that clear. So between 1983 and 1985, Various working parties were established to undertake that detailed planning to relocate more than 100 residents into the community. And this meant, in practical terms, the purchase of 23 houses. And these houses needed to be situated 
in ordinary residential set settings, but as close as possible to amenities such as public transport or local shopping strips and parks. And each of these house houses would provide accommodation for between two and five residents. And there was also funding that was made available to ensure that each of these houses could prop be properly furnished. So by July 1948, all 23 properties had been purchased and the final stage of that process of in the institutionalization could begin. So that month, the first groups of St Nicholas residents were relocated into their newly acquired homes. And by the following year, the final group of five residents moved out and that institution was closed. So the closure of St Nicholas and the relocation of its residents into the community was without precedent in Victoria. This sort of thing had never been done before in the state, but it's really obviously important to remember that by the early 1980s, the deinstitutionalization of people with intellectual disability was already occurring in many other countries around the world. And so by 1985, when St Nicholas was finally closed, the UK, the USA, and a number of Scandinavian countries were probably further down that deinstitutionalization path than Australia. But the stated aims that underpin the closure of St Nicholas which were to increase a resident's participation in normal life routines, to increase community contact, and to increase the likelihood that residents would realise their potential, those aims would have resonated in any of those other countries seeking to replace their own institutions with community services at the time. Um, so five, five of those six institutions that I outlined above uh, were all closed during the Kennet years. But the task of closing the Kew Cottages would ultimately fall to a new Victorian Premier, Steve Brax, who to almost everyone's surprise uh, formed government in September 1999, and he remained in power for the next, uh, next eight years. So Steve Brax announced his government's commitment to closing Kew on, uh, what was it, the 4th of May 2001, and he outlined his plan for redeveloping the 27 hectare site. And in his speech that day, he echoed some of the things that, uh, some of the themes that Kennedy had touched on a couple of years earlier. He described the living conditions at Kew as appalling and not of the nature we would have in a civilised society. So, at the time of Brax's announcement, there were still 462 residents living on site at the Kew Cottages. And under his $100 million redevelopment plan, most of those residents would be relocated to new homes across Melbourne and also Victoria, and a mini suburb of 270 homes and apartments would be built on the Kew Cottages site. And Brax is really keen to point out that every cent of money earned from the disposal of that property would be channeled back into disability services. And he also sought to reassure uh, the residents and their families that no one would be relocated without proper consultation. And the plan did include uh, provisions for 20 new community residential units to be built on the site. And these units were essentially to provide accommodation for up to 100 former residents who had, either, who had lived at Kew for most of their lives. And uh, obviously, as Jane Tracy mentioned, uh, that wasn't, it wasn't necessarily the case, but uh, that was the plan at the time. And what Brack said about closing QE he said this would be a fantastic step on the road to deinstitutionalisation. And Christine Campbell, who was the Community Services Minister at the time, also spoke that day and she made a similar point. She called the redevelopment a visionary and innovative project. For the first time, she said, a community would be built around residents with intellectual disability rather than the other way around. Um, so in one analysis of deinstitutionalisation in Victoria um, by my colleagues Christine Biz Bigby and Ilan Wiesel, uh, they noted that some institutions were closed in the face of opposition from residents, parents and staff. And other scholars have noted a similar theme in a number of countries around the world. And it, and it does appear that wherever it has occurred, deinstitutionalisation has been a controversial policy at times. And it also appears that although many parents of people with intellectual disabilities were opposed to deinstitutionalisation, this opposition, opposition often didn't really have any impact on the policies of those governments already committed to closing their institutions. But in its attempt to close the Kew Cottages, the Victorian government was about to face its biggest challenge for parents yet. Now, 
when we talk about parent opposition to the closure of Kew, what we're really talking about is the Kew Cottages Parents Association, which had been established in 1957 and had played quite a prominent role in the affairs of the institution since that time. So the Parents Association had actually been quite vocal in the past already about its scepticism around ideas like normalisation, and it also raised its concerns about deinstitutionalisation. So it probably came as quite a shock to the government when the Parents Association initially welcomed a Brax announcement in 2001. The association newsletter uh, that month noted that although the plan still lacked a number of important details, there is much to be very pleased with this plan, within this plan. Um, but within two uh, years, that goodwill between the Parents Association and the Victorian government had dissipated. And in 2003, the Australian newspaper was reporting that the Kew Cottages had become this site, uh, had become an epic battleground for one of the great social conflicts of our time. And so the, the Australian newspaper talked about how on one side of this debate was the Victorian government and numerous social policy experts who were in favour of institution busting and who were seeking to dismantle the last vestiges of an era when disabled people were hidden away. And then the, and then the Australian talked about how on the other side was this group of parents concerned about their children and about, they, about whether they could live a good life outside the walls of Kew. And um, a mother of one of the uh, residents, Rosalie Trower, who was also a Kew Cottages Parents Association a committee member, articulated some of these concerns when she told the age that parents were fearful and frightened about where their children will, will live. It's a lonely world out there, she said, and today's society is not an embracing kind society. So the main issue as far as uh, a lot of the parents association members was concerned is that most a lot of parents wanted their children to remain on site at the Kew Cottages in, in clustered housing. And what the association meant when they used this term clustered housing was something similar to what the Kennett government had already done when it redeveloped the Janefield and Kingsbury Training Centre in October 1997. And so that redevelopment had involved the placement of 250 former residents into new homes across the state, but also the relocation or the resettlement, I guess, of another 100 residents who required a higher level of support into, new, into a new housing estate that was built on the old Janefield site. And so that facility named Plenty Residential Services comprised 23 dwellings grouped around prettily landscaped courts, much like any normal housing estate, I guess, but it was equipped to protect the privacy and ensure the safety of all residents. And as early as 1998, the Parents Association had proposed that any redevelopment of Q should follow a similar format. Um, to the consternation of a, a number of uh, association members, that clustered housing proposal never really gained any tra traction. It was rejected first by the Kennett government in 1998, and it was again rejected by the Brax government in 2001. And a year later, the Community Services Minister Bronwyn Pike explained why the Labor government had refused to go down that clustered housing path. And what she said is that clustered housing would replicate the problems associated with institutions, which meant that people with intellectual disabilities would never get a chance to participate in society. So Pike went on to explain that any form of segregation was not in the spirit of inclusion and that a broader base of accommodation and support options situated within the community was the key to inclusion. Um, now that was obviously a good point, but it did not stop this really heated debate in many Melbourne newspapers about what should be done at Kew. And the letters to the editors of all major Melbourne newspapers captured something of the tenor of this debate. So on one side, there was a mother who wrote, I keep hearing people say that people with intellectual disabilities have a right to live in the community. Bloody hell, it's also their right not to live in the community. And then on the other side of this debate was another woman who took quite a different position in her letter to the Herald Sun in September 2003. The closure of the Kew cottages could not come quickly enough, she wrote, and she urged parents to let go of it and give their daughters and sons an opportunity to strive and enjoy their lives in more pleasant surroundings. So in one respect, this process that involved with closing the Kew cottages and relocating its residents into the community was not dissimilar 
to the process of closing any other institution. There were houses that need to be sourced or renovated and built from scratch. Decisions had to be made about specific resident groupings and about individuals, any individual support needs. And none of this sort of thing would have been new to Alma Adams, the public servant who was employed to oversee that closure. Adams had done it all before. She'd already overseen the closure of the Kalula Institution and also overseen the James, Janefield and Kingsbury Training Centres Centre closure. But in another respect, this was a really new challenge because Adams was closing an institution in the face of this really strong parental opposition and really quite a negative campaign in the Melbourne press. And I guess if there's a positive to be found in such a negative and divisive campaign, it was probably this. Increased scrutiny of the closure of the institution would probably benefit those with the most at stake. And of course, that's the residents of Kew themselves. Um, so throughout this process, the Department of Human, Human Services really sought to assure, reassure in, interested observers of the extent to which it was considering the needs of each individual as it went about closing the cottages. So a resident assessment consultation and planning team was established to undertake extensive an extensive period as, as of assessment of each resident because, as the DHS put it, the individual needs and personality of each resident would be a priority in determining where and with whom each lived. So this planning team comprised case managers and therapists from external agencies and other Q Cottages staff and they carried out an assessment of each individual in order to get an overall picture of their specific support needs. Next, each resident was allocated a case manager and that case manager became that key point of contact for the, remainder, for the remainder of the planning process. And so the case manager consulted with residents, uh, with family members, with guardians and other advocates about preferences and support needs. And then they drew up what it was called a general service plan for each resident. And there was a further layer of uh, protection for individuals. Uh, rights, sorry, for individual rights that was provided for by the Intellectual Disability Review Panel. And so this was an independent body that monitored the whole process and signed off on each individual's general service plan prior to relocation. And one former panel member recalled of that re review panel that it just added that quality to the process and ensured that important aspects around planning processes have not been missed. And it also gave parents or advocates a peace of mind that there was someone watching over the whole process to ensure best outcomes for their residents. So as with previous closures, the choice of the lo location of these new homes took into account a number of different factors. And, they, and these included where a resident's family lived, nearby facilities, the features of the local community and the extent to which certain day programs would be accessible in any given location. A lot of thought and planning went into deciding who would live with whom. Alma Adams had this to say about that. We looked at all the information we had about certain individuals and then we proposed groups of people who could live together based on, on that information. And she also explained that one of the overt decisions that they made really early in the piece was that people with certain, certain disabilities did not necessarily need to live in the same home. So the decision was made around friendships and compatibilities, Adam said. It wasn't around support needs. So on the 6th of October 2002, the first group of residents, three men and two women, moved out of the cottages and into their new home uh, in Doncaster East. And one reporter from the age was there to witness the move. And he, he referred to the five residents as pioneers who were making their way out of the sprawling 130 year old residential institution and moving into a spick and span new home of their own in East Doncaster. They were embarking on an extraordinary personal adventure, he said, that would involve a new life in the community with up to eight staff to help around the house. Um, so the new Doncaster East home was in the Banal Quad Quadrant, uh, for anyone who knows um, Doncaster East, and was pretty well located. It was close enough to local shops. There was a large reserve a few blocks away, and there was also a day centre, which was just a short drive uh, on, down Anderson's Creek Road. Richard Lindemann, who, was, uh, who knew each resident and had worked at Kew for 18 years, was appointed to the role of house manager, house supervisor. And as far as he was concerned, the main challenge was making that Doncaster East house a home. 
It's hard work making things look normal, he said. And the big challenge is to make it a home first rather than a work site. Um, so three more homes opened that year in Ringwood East, Mitcham and uh, Croydon. And then a further 12 were, op were opened the following year. And as new houses were opened, the older, more decrepit units at the Kew Cottages were progressively closed. So by May 2004, 85 residents had been relocated into 17 new houses across Melbourne. And the units 13, 15 and 28 at the Kew Cottages had been closed. Um, the DHS had this newsletter, Q, New, Q News, which tracked the progress of each new house and told personal relocation stories of individual residents and staff. And it kept interested observers up to date about the plans for the redevelopment of the Q site. Um, given that the Department of, the Human, Service, of Human Services ultimately wanted to highlight the benefits of deinstitutionalisation, it's probably not surprising that Q News told a largely positive story of the redevelopment of Q. Um, but the positive story appears to reflect the reality. Alma Adams recalled that only four of the 360 residents relocated from the Kew Cottages had serious issues in the transition. And a 2003 report by Gary Radler that focused on the experiences of the first 30 residents to move out of the cottages found that in terms of health, in terms of safety, and in terms of happiness, the evidence suggested that the closure of the Kew was going to be a success. And that report also noticed the positive response of residents and family members and the staff in the new homes. Um, the whole process of relocating 360 residents to new homes in the community took just over four years. And, those, and the final group of residents, five men in, in their 40s and 50s, moved into their new home in Ivanhoe in August 2006. And that same journalist was there to witness uh, this final move, and this is what he had to, uh, had to say. For the five old boys from Kew Cottages, uh, it spelled a new beginning, and for the Brax government, it marked the successful conclusion in moving people into the community. Um, now, of course, the final piece of this puzzle was yet to be completed. There were still 100 residents in what was left of the Kew Cottages waiting for the redevelopment of the site to begin. But off-site, the relocation had been a success to the extent that it had closely followed the plan that Brax had outlined in 2001. And later, Elmer Adams explained that there were no delays in the off-site relocation of the Kew Cottages residents. That, she said, all rolled out as we had planned it would. But Adams also acknowledged that there were some significant delays to the redevelopment of the Kew Cottages site where the last 20 homes were to be uh, built. And according to Adams, those delays could be summarised as planning and heritage delays, which I think was a bit of a euphemism for a really hard fought and bitter campaign by some people who simply didn't really want to see that queue development proceed. Um, and although the chapter on which this talk is based does go into some of that detail around that uh, deep, uh, redevelopment debate, it's not something we can talk about here simply because I'm running out of time. Um, but the Kew Cottages was closed, but, uh, but by the time the Kew Cottages was closed, a substantial body of research analysing the closure of the institutions in Australia and around the world has shown that large scale congregate care facilities tended to stifle the chances of their residents living a meaningful or enjoyable life. And in fact, the research uh, examining deinstitutional constantly showed that people with intellectual disabilities living in small-scale community-based residents enjoyed a better quality life than people living in large institutions. And as Australia's oldest institution for people with intellectual disabilities was progressively demolished and its uh, old rundown buildings replaced by one identical box, boxy house after another, the evaluations carried out on the cottages closure revealed a similar story. For all its problems, including that protracted redevelopment of the site itself, the closure of Kew Cottages needed to be, needs to be understood as a success. And by that, I don't mean that deinstitutionalisation was this perfectly designed policy. It wasn't. And it hasn't necessarily delivered on all its promises. And Chris Beebe could definitely talk to some of those issues uh, later if that's a theme that we want to explore. But the outcomes of deinstitutionalisation at the Kew Cottages were significant and long lasting for those most involved. And perhaps Alma Adams, who oversaw that whole process, summed it up best when she said, if we had waited to get everything right, it might never have happened at all. And when viewed from the perspective of the residents of Kew themselves, deinstitutionalisation can also be un un understood as a successful policy. And the fact that uh, 
the reaction, the reaction of many former residents to Kew to the relocation into the community hints at a positive story. One resident, Ralph Dawson, spoke about how much he liked his new home. I'm very happy here, he said. I've got my keys and my own bedroom, which was obviously more than could be said for the Kew Cottages. And when asked to compare his new home to the cottages, another former re resident simply replied, I like it better here. And yet another resident, Patty Rogers, who was even more firmer in her opinion. Patty Rogers was one of the first residents to be re relocated out of Kew. And when asked about Kew, Patty Rogers had said, I don't like it there, I hate it. I'm happy to be out of Kew. Thanks.